So in the last video we discussed the fundamentals of just a program in general uh, and also some things about just computers in general. So we talked about hardware, software, the different types of software. We had OS and application software. And then we talked about, you know, what makes up a program. We talked about programming languages, compiling, all that stuff. Uh, this video we're going to talk about the fundamentals of Java itself. Uh, and this is actually kind of a lengthy topic, so I'm going to split this into two videos. So this is the first part, and then the second video will be Java Fundamentals Part 2. So the topics that we're going to cover in this video, we're going to talk about the different parts of a Java program. So we talked about the parts of a generic program in the last video. Uh, we're going to talk about the parts of a Java program in this video. We're going to discuss the print and print line methods, or print ln. It says print line is the name. And we'll talk about what those are. And we'll discuss the Java API. We'll readdress variables and something called literals. We'll talk about data types. We'll talk about our operators um, and our assignment operators. So that's all stuff we're going to talk about in this video. Parts of a Java program. So this is a very simple program. Um, and I'm going to talk about some syntax. If you remember from the last video, um, syntax is very important. So I may flip between this and IntelliJ just to kind of show you um, how to actually do this yourself. So whenever I create a new Java file, I need to give this file a specific name, right? And we call these files classes. Um, so I'm going to create a new Java class. So I right clicked my source code folder. I hovered over new and I'm creating a new Java class. I'm just going to call this class simple. So we'll see that my public class name is simple with a capital S and we can see that my file name is simple.java also with a capital S, right? So if I go back to PowerPoint, my file name is simple.java, right? Something to take away about Java is that it is a case sensitive language meaning capitalization does matter in Java. Um, there are other languages out there that are not case sensitive. Java is not one of those. We do need to keep an eye on our capitalization because it is important. So our file name is simple.java with a capital S. And now I'm gonna kind of break this program down line by line. So the first line is a what we call a comment, okay? And if you remember from the last video, we said that um, each programming language has its own syntax. Uh, the double slash or the double forward slash here is part of Java's syntax. So this tells Java that I am actually writing a comment here when I put two forward slashes. All a comment is, is it's a programmer message that can help explain what's going on in your code. Um, and when this compiles, the compiler is going to see these two forward slashes. It's going to recognize, oh, okay, this is a comment. I'm going to ignore everything from the two forward slashes to the end of the line. Okay. Um, and then line two is a blank line. You'll notice there's nothing on line two. Um, that's just because it makes the program a little easier to read. Um, a lot of times people will put blank lines in between things just to make them easier to read. So comments are just messages that are ignored by the compiler and we signify the beginning of a comment with two forward slashes. Let's move on to line three where it says public class simple. Now this is what we call a class header um, and it will mark the beginning of a class definition. And we're going to talk about how to use classes later in the course, but for now, uh, let's just talk about classes in terms of, they're like a container for our application, right? So if I go back here, anything that I want my program to do needs to go inside this class, right? 
So think about class simple as my container, right? So what does public mean? Well, public is a Java keyword. If you remember in the last video, we talked about keywords. We talked about um, programmer defined words, right? Those are two different types of words we have. Keywords are reserved words in the Java programming language that have a special meaning. Public is one of those keywords. We call, the, we call public an access specifier. Um, and for now, all of our stuff is gonna be public. Uh, you'll learn more about private and stuff later. It's public and private and protected are the three that we are primarily concerned with. Uh, public just means that access to this class is unrestricted. Okay. Now, a really important thing that you need to remember, a Java file can have several classes inside of it, okay? Um, but there can only be one public class in a file, and that public class has to have a name that matches the file name. So let's go back to our example here. My class is called public class simple with a capital S. My file name has to match this public class name. It's just part of how Java works. If I had public class chicken and my file name was simple.java, it wouldn't work. It won't compile. They have to match each other. So simple.java, public class simple, right? They match. Again, Java is case sensitive. So if my file name is capital simple.java, my class needs to be public class capital simple, okay? The word class is also a keyword that indicates the beginning of a class definition. Simple is just the name that we made up as a programmer. If you remember back in IntelliJ, I created this file called simple.java and I also have public class simple. I made up simple. Um, that's a programmer defined name. What about these braces? So we've talked about the header here, right? We have these two curly braces. What are those doing? What are those for? Um, the left brace character on line four right here, we also call that an opening brace, is associated with the beginning of the class definition, right? So this is kind of where all of our stuff is gonna be enclosed um, within these braces. So the left brace is the opening brace and the right brace is the closing brace, right? Everything in between the opening and closing brace, we call that the class body, right? So anything that we write in between these two braces is going to be our class body. Very important, you must have a closing brace for every opening brace in your program. You have to have a closing one that corresponds to it, or it won't compile. That's part of Java's syntax. If I have 10 opening braces and 9 closing braces, the compiler is going to say, hey, you're missing a closing brace somewhere. I'm not compiling this code. Right. Let's talk about the main method here. So we call this line a method header, um, and it marks the beginning of a method. What is a method? A method is just a group of one or more programming statements that collectively have a name. If you remember when we talked about sub-processes with our algorithms, um, which was just a named set of steps that you want to execute at will, that's basically what a method is, right? It's a group of statements that you give a name to. The compiler does require several things when you create a method. We'll learn a lot more about methods later. Um, but for right now, notice that this method is called main with a lowercase m, and we have the words public static void in front of it. For now, before we start talking about methods, just remember that every single program that you write in this course 
has to have this exact method. Public static void main, parent with the parentheses, string with the brackets, args. All right, it'll look exactly like this. Um, every single program we write in this course will have this method. Every single program you write in 1260 will have a main method. Okay. The reason for that, um, which for now I'll just kind of give you the, the highlight of that is, the main method is a special method that Java looks for when you actually try to run your program. Right, when you run your program, that Java virtual machine is going to say, where is the main method? If you don't have a main method, nothing will happen. So just know that you have to have this. Every main method will have this header, like I said. Every Java application must have a method named main. And again, it's kind of the starting point of the application. It's where it looks for the first instruction to actually execute. So, back to IntelliJ here. Let's just say that I have a program, and we'll learn about the print method here in a second. But let's just say that I want to print the word hello, okay, to the user. If I were to try to run this, I don't even have the option to run this, right? Because I don't have a main method. When I click on run, it's going to say there's nothing to run here. You don't have a main method. Now, if I were to put the main method here, and again, it will always look like this, public static void main string brackets args. You could Google that if you forget it, because um, the main method will be the same no matter what Java application you're writing. So now when I try to run this, we'll see that my program did run because it found this main method, right? So make sure that all of your programs have a main method in them. Now you'll notice with my main method, I have an opening brace and a closing brace. So just like my class, my method also has braces. Anything inside my method braces is part of my method body, right? So you can kind of see how we're nesting everything inside these braces. So this line here, thinking back to the last video when we talked about programming statements, uh, this line is part of the method body, which is inside the methods opening and closing braces. So I could change this to match what's in the slides. Programming is fun, right? This programming statement is inside these braces, which means it's part of the method body. Very simply, this will just display a message to the screen. Um, the message is printed without the quotation marks. Um, and we call this group of characters a string literal. The words programming is fun, we call that a string literal. And we'll talk about literals later in the video. So just keep that tucked away for now. This is really the only line in my program that does anything, right? In terms of telling the computer to do something, all these other lines besides this one, while they're necessary for my program, they don't really do anything, right? This line right here is the only one where I'm telling the computer something specific. System, output, print some text. What text am I printing? I'm printing this text right here. Okay, so again, the statements of my program, or the things that end in a semicolon, those are what I'm actually telling the computer to do. The rest of this is part of the syntax, right? Let's think about semicolons again. Back to our programming language syntax. We remember that all programming languages have some form of punctuation. So our curly braces are part of the punctuation and our semicolons are part of a punctuation. Think about this like a period in a sentence, okay? Um, we mark 
a sentence with a period at the end of the sentence, right? Um, just like we would do that, we mark the end of a Java statement with a semicolon. Not every line of code, however, will end with a semicolon. A comment will not end with a semicolon because it's ignored by the compiler, right? So if I go back to IntelliJ here, let's, let's put a comment up here. This is a comment. This doesn't need a semicolon, right? Because the compiler is ignoring it. It doesn't care if there's a semicolon there or not. This is just for developer eyes or programmer eyes only, right? My class header does not need a semicolon because it's not a programming statement. My method header does not need a semicolon because it's not a programming statement, right? This right here is a programming statement and thus it needs a semicolon. And if you want to think about class and method headers, right? This is a class header. This is a method header. They don't really need semicolons because their punctuation is the curly braces. Right? They already have their own form of punctuation, the opening brace and the closing brace. The brace characters themselves are not statements either, so you don't put a semicolon after them. Like I wouldn't put a semicolon right here because this left brace is not a statement. It's not telling the computer to do something that I don't need one there. So semicolons only go after our programming statements. So here's a little table of some special characters if you want to go back and look at these slides if you forget what these characters mean. Double slash or the double forward slash marks the beginning of a comment. And again, a comment was just a uh, developer message that has something to do with what the program is doing. Parentheses, we use those in a method header opening and closing braces. These enclose a group of statements, such as the contents of a class or the contents of a method, right? So the contents of my class is everything inside my class braces. The contents of my method are everything inside my method braces, right? And I could have several lines of code here Right, all of these lines of code are part of my method body, right? Because they're inside the braces of the method. Quotation marks enclose a string of characters, such as a message that we want to print to the screen. And again, those are double quotation marks. Um, these go around any kind of message that I want to display. And the message is not displayed with the quotes around it, right? If I were to run this code, Programming is fun, and my output does not have quotes around it, right? Um, that's just necessary to tell Java this is a message that I'm displaying. And a semicolon, again, marks the end of a complete programming statement. So quick recap of all that. Java is a case-sensitive language. Every Java program has to be stored in a file that ends with .java. Comments are ignored by the compiler. A .java file can have several classes inside of it, but there can only be one public class inside of the file. And I will say best, most often you will only have one class per file. You can technically have several classes per file, but the best practice is to have one class per file. Any public class must have the same name as the file itself. So again, public class simple is my class name, matches my file name, which is simple.java, right? They're the same name, simple here, simple up here. Every Java application has to have a method named main we need a main method in every application that we run, right? And our main method header will always look like this. Every single time, it'll look exactly like this. 
you need to have a corresponding closing brace to every opening brace. Statements are terminated with a semicolon. This does not include comments, method headers, class headers, or the curly braces. This is kind of a recap of what we just talked about. Moving on to the print and the print line methods. So this is how we kind of display things to the screen to a user. And we're also going to discuss the Java API here. So the Java API, which stands for Application Programmer Interface, is just a library of pre-written classes for performing specific operations. These classes and their methods are available to all Java programs. Uh, we can use the Java API to handle output, uh, we can use it to handle input, we can use it to do mathematical functions, all kinds of things uh, we can do with the Java API. Now a lot of people get tripped up on what an API is or what a library of classes actually means, but just think about the Java API like a folder somewhere on your computer that has a ton of .java files in it. Okay, It has a ton of classes that some Java developer wrote Somebody wrote that code file. And we can just use those files to do things, right? We don't have to actually write the logic of how do I send signals to the monitor that displays what I just typed in, right? We don't have to worry about that. Somebody's already done that for us. It's included when we download Java, the Java development kit, right? It's included with that. We just use it. So when I say the word console output, um, in ye olden times, the word console um, refers to when an operator would interact with a large computer system by typing on like a little tiny terminal that consisted of a very simple screen and a keyboard. Um, and that terminal was known as the console. So you would interact with the giant computer with a little tiny screen at the keyboard that was the console. The console screen only displayed text. There was no mouse, there was no icons, there was none of that. It was just you typed it in and it would give you text, right? Um, that was called the standard output device. Times have changed, obviously. So today we say standard output device is the device that displays console output. So bringing that to a, an applicable thing for this class, this is my console down here, right? When I run my program, if I'm running it with console output, which I am, um, it will display my output down here in this window. So this is kind of my console down here. How do we output text in Java? We're going to learn another way to output text later in the semester. Um, but for now, we're just going to focus on console output. And this statement from the program earlier shows one way to do that. So remember the Java API that we talked about, right? As a library of pre-written code that we can have access to. System, capital system, is a class or a code file in that API that contains objects and methods that perform system level operations. So things like your output and input on a system level, right? Your keyboard input, your monitor output. Stuff like that is handled by the system class. So we can use this system class and we can use the out object um, to output something from the computer to us, the user, right? So our out object has some actions that it can do. We can say print, or we can say print ln or print line. Those are two different ways that we can output something to the console, right? And again, we said the console was this window down here. So I have right here, I'm accessing the system class from the Java API. 
I'm accessing the output method of the system class. I'm sorry, system class. I'm accessing the out object. And then I'm using the out object to display something to the screen. And we'll learn more about how this works when we talk about methods. But for now, that's just kind of how this works, right? System out object print line method. And then in parentheses, I have what I'm actually going to print. And because this is a statement, I need a semicolon, right? You may have noticed these little periods that separate um, the different names of the objects, right? We call that, we just say that as the word dot. So if I were to read this statement out loud, it would say system.out.println. That's how you would read this verbally. So let's kind of break that down and, and think about how that works. We said that the system class is part of the Java API, right? So the system class holds the out object as well as a bunch of other objects, but the out object is the one that we're focusing on right now. The out object has the print method and the print line method. So you can kind of see this hierarchy that we use when we say system dot out dot print or system dot out dot print line. All right, we have to go in an order, biggest to smallest. So let's let's think about a method argument. Um, the value that we want to display to the screen goes inside the parentheses, right? Which we discussed a second ago. So I say system.out.println. I have to have parentheses here, and anything that's in the parentheses will be displayed. We call that thing inside the parentheses that has a term, whatever this is inside parentheses, we call that the argument, right? That's called the argument. So what our, what our statement here is saying, we're gonna execute the print line method and we're gonna use the words King Arthur as our argument. And what that will do functionally, right, is it will display the words King Arthur to the screen without the quotation marks. So I've discussed print and I've discussed print line, um, right? We said system.out.print or system.out.print line. These are two separate methods that do slightly different things. What's the difference? Well, if I say print line, what that does is it will advance the cursor to the beginning of the next line after it displays its message. The next item printed on the screen will begin in this position. Basically what that says is anything printed after a print line statement will be on a new line, right? So let's do an example of that. So I've used system.out.println here, right? Saying the words programming is fun. Because I use the print line method, my cursor is now on a second line, a new line that is empty, right? So if I say system.out.println, is it really? This should be on a separate line, right? Which we see that it is. So our first print line statement moved my cursor down here. My second print line statement prints out, is it really? And it moves the cursor down here. Right? So if I were to print something else, if I print something else, that should be on a new line, right? Because we're using print line. So if you want to think about sort of super basic way to remember it, print line creates a new line after it's done printing.
So anything printed after a print line statement will be on a new line. Print does not do that. So system.out.print keeps the cursor on the same line when it's done. Anything we print after a print statement will be on the same line. So instead of it being on a new line, it will be on the same line. So let's do an example of that. If I just say system.out.print here, all three of these will be on the same line because the print method does not advance the cursor down to a new line at all. So if I run this, we'll see that they're all on the same line as opposed to print line. Now the use of those is totally um, dependent on what you're doing, right? Sometimes it may matter that it's on a new line, sometimes it might not, um, but that's just what they do. I would say 99% of the time you're just going to use print line for this uh, because it's nice to have your things on separate lines. So TLDR of that print line prints things on new lines. Print prints things on the same line. Now let's talk about escape sequences and control characters. These are special um, characters here that we can use in print statements that do specific things. So an escape sequence begins with a backslash character. And if you ever forget backslash and forward slash, backslash looks like it's falling backwards, forward slash looks like it's falling forwards. Um, but an escape sequence begins with a backslash character and is followed by one or more control characters. What they do is it lets you just control the way output is displayed within the string itself. Uh, so what this does, backslash n, is a new line character or a new line escape sequence. So what this will do is it will say the once and future king, go down to a new line, and then display by th white. Right, so backslash n is a special sequence that's not actually printed to the screen, um, but it's controlling what is happening with my message. So If I run this, I only have one print line statement, right? So it may seem like this will all be on one line, but if I run this, we'll see that I have the once and future king. I have my new line, right? Because I put a new line character here by th white. There are all kinds of escape sequences. Uh, we'll get some we may get some practice with these as the semester goes on, but there are different escape sequences we can use. And here's a table of those. I would say the most important ones are the new line escape sequences and the tab escape sequence. So backslash T lets you kind of display a tab. It'll tab text over. Um, and then if you want to actually backslash, backslash, that would let you print out a backslash. So for example, what happens if I want to, what if I actually want these quotation marks displayed? What if I want quotation marks around the title of my book? Well, Java will be really weird if I do that. It's going to give me all kinds of errors you can see here uh, because quotation marks mean something special in Java, right? So if I want to actually print out quotation marks, I can use an escape sequence to print those out. So backslash always starts an escape sequence. Backslash double quote is an escape sequence that says just print out a double quote, right? So if I use that escape sequence there, we can see that my quotation marks are actually displayed. Let's say I wanted to tab over by th white. We can see that I now have a tab here. Right, So the escape sequences can be used for different things. 
and we'll get some practice with those as the semester goes on. Moving on to variables and literals, and this is very important here. So let's talk about, let's revisit what a variable is. We discussed in the last video that variables are just named locations in memory, right? Um, they refer to a memory location and the name is something that we create, right? If I want to use a variable in my program, I have to do something called variable declaration, basically saying, hey compiler, I'm gonna create a variable, here's what its name is, okay? So we're declaring that that variable exists. And what a declaration does is it tells the compiler the variable's name and it also tells the compiler what type of data is this variable going to hold. Is it going to hold a number? Is it going to hold a string, like a, like a word or a name? Is it going to hold a date? Is it going to hold a boolean, true, false? What's it going to hold? Those are the two things that happen with declaration, right? The name of the variable and the data type. So in our example here, let's look at line five. Line five is an example of variable declaration. This is variable declaration right here. And I'm gonna undo that because it looks bad. And the order that we do that in, in Java is we first tell the compiler what type of data the variable is gonna hold. Here it is an integer, and we'll discuss data types in a second. And then we give it a name and then a semicolon because this is a statement, right? So I'm telling the compiler, hey, in my memory, here's my little RAM drawing here. In my memory somewhere, I want there to be a spot allocated for an integer value, and I want that to be named value, right? And now anytime that I want to access this place in memory that's gonna store a number, I can just call it by name, value, right? So that's variable declaration. We have to do this anytime I wanna use a variable. What is a literal? When I say the word literal, a literal is just what it sounds like. It's a literal value that goes inside of a variable. So here on line six, my literal would be five right? Five is not a variable name. It's not a data type. It's, it's five, right? It's the number five. It is a literal number. So what I'm saying here on line six is I've told the compiler on line five that I want to create a place in memory named value to store a number, right? Value is empty. There is no number inside of it. Here on line six, I'm saying, hey, take this literal five and throw it in value, right? That's basically what this is saying. So I already said in the last video, the equal sign is not equal to, right, in Java. This is not saying value is equal to five. That is not what this is saying. What this equal sign in Java is, is an assignment operator. So if we were to read this in English, we would say value is assigned a value of five, right? Not equals, assigned. And like it says here, what basically is happening is it's an operator that stores the value on the right side of the, the operator into the variable on the left side of the operator. So five is being stored inside of value, okay? Let's talk about string concatenation. This is a topic that is actually pretty simple for a lot of people and pretty complicated for some. So the plus operator here 
If I use that with strings, and remember strings are just anything inside quotes, when I use the plus operator with a string, we call it the string concatenation operator. So this is a little different than like saying two plus four, right? Because that would be six. Here we're saying this is plus one string. So what does that do with strings, right? Because numbers, it would give you a sum. But with strings, what it does is it just smushes them together, right? It connects them or concatenates them, right? Concatenate means to append. So the string concatenation operator appends one string to another string. So if we were to execute this code, this is space plus one string would yield this result here. This is one string, right? They've been smushed together. String concatenation um, can also be used to concatenate the contents of a variable to a string. So let's do an example of that here. Let's say that I have Let's say that I have a variable here called author. And again, I'm doing variable declaration, right? And we'll do it the way that we've learned so far. I'm telling the compiler I have a variable named author and it's going to store a string value, right? Then I say author is assigned the string thy. So maybe I wanna use my new string concatenation skills, right, I'm doing a plus sign here. What this will do is it will say the once and future king by, and then it's gonna concatenate whatever this variable value is to my string, right? So whatever's stored inside of here is gonna be smushed onto the end of the string. So, TH white is stored inside of author. So TH white will be smushed onto the end of the string. Hopefully, right, we'll see. So if we run this, we'll see that it was. Let's change the author here. Right, let's change that. We can see that it still does the same thing, right? Functionally, it's the exact same. Whatever is stored inside the variable is just gonna be smushed onto the end of our string here because we use this concatenation operator. If the argument used in a print statement needs to be on multiple lines, we can break the argument into smaller strings and use the concatenation operator to spread them out over multiple lines. That's kind of a confusing way of basically saying if you have several things, let's just say you got a really long string here. Right, you got a crazy long string. It looks bad on one line. You can split that up, right? If you split this up into smaller strings, you can use that concatenation operator to just smush these strings together. Right, and that does the same thing. Now, let's talk about quotation marks. Quotation marks, like I mentioned earlier, they mean something very special in Java. Right? If you try to put quotation marks around something that is not intended to be a string literal, you're gonna get an error. Um, so if I declare that year is an integer value, right? Int is a number, an integer is a number. Let's say I declare something that's gonna store an integer, and I say year is 2021 in quotes. We talked about literals, right? We said here in our example before, the number five is my literal right here. 
Well, here in my example, the string 2021 is my literal. And we know it's a string because it's got double quotes around it, right? Well, I've already told the compiler that year stores an integer, not a string, right? So putting quotes around this makes it a string, and I've got an error here. If I hover over this, it'll say, hey, I'm requiring this to be an integer. You're giving me a string, so either change year to a string or change 2021 to an int. Right. So if I get rid of those double quotes, 2021 is now a number value and it's fine. So just remember that strings do mean something in Java. Or, sorry, quotation marks do mean something in Java. Now, we're going to talk about some, some best practice stuff here. We have something called camel case that we use in this course for identifier names. So things like variable names, method names, so on and so forth, we use camel case. And what camel case says is the first letter is lowercase. Any other words that you have, if it's multiple words, are going to have a capital first letter. So for example here, camel case is two words. The first letter of camel is lowercase. The first letter of case is uppercase, right? So if I were to do an example of that, this would be an example of camel case, right? First letter of the first word is lowercase. Every other word in this variable name has an uppercase first letter. That's what we call camel case. Right? So that's camel case. We use that for variable names and method names. Now, the first character must be an alphanumeric, or a, I'm sorry, the first letter has to be an alphabetical character, an underscore, or a dollar sign. That's just part of how Java works. If it's not one of those things, it's not going to work. After the first character, you can use alphanumeric characters, underscores, or dollar signs. I will say you probably don't want to use underscores and dollar signs in this class or numbers. Just stick with alphabetical characters. Uppercase and lowercase letters are distinct in Java. I can't stress that enough. Java is case sensitive. So items ordered in camel case, right, notice the capital O, is different than items ordered with a lowercase o. These are, these are totally different things according to Java because the capitalization is different. Like I said earlier, the dollar sign is a legal identifier character. You can technically use it. Uh, we typically use that for very special purposes though, so don't use it in your variable names. Identifiers cannot include spaces. Identifiers cannot include spaces. They can include them. They cannot include them. Please don't put spaces. Spaces also mean something special in Java. When you create a variable, if you put spaces here, you're going to get an error. You'll see I have an error here that says I'm expecting a semicolon, right? Whenever you put a space there, it thinks that you're done typing your statement. So any variable name you create or any method name you create, they cannot have spaces in those names. That's why we use camel case, right? So here's some variable names and whether they're legal or illegal according to Java, right? Day of week, this is a perfectly legal variable name. It's a good example of camel case. Day is lowercase. Of and week are both uppercase. 3D graph, illegal. Identifiers cannot begin with a digit, right? We said the very first character has to be a letter, an underscore, or a dollar sign. June 1997 is a legal identifier. Again, we don't typically put numbers in our variable names, but you can do it. 
Mixture number three is illegal because we can only use alphabetic letters, digits, underscores, or dollar signs. Weak space day is illegal because identifiers cannot contain spaces, right? So just keep that in mind. And IntelliJ is good about telling you if you're doing it wrong. So if I put if I put this here for my variable name and I hover over this, it's going to tell me that there's something wrong here. So you can pick it up pretty easily by using IntelliJ. Moving on to primitive data types. A data type is called primitive when you cannot use it to create an object. So what does that mean? Well, objects have attributes and methods like we discussed. Primitive variables can only hold a single value and does not have attributes or methods, right? So primitive variables can hold one value at a time and they don't have any methods and they don't have any attributes. And these are the types of variables that we're going to look at first in this course, is primitive variables. So some primitive data types we have for numbers or numeric data. We have bytes, shorts, ints, longs, floats, and doubles. And I'm not going to read through all these, but you can see the different sizes that they take up, and you can see the range. So for the most part, we'll be using int or an integer. And this will allow us to have an integer value from negative 2 billion something to positive 2 billion something. This is usually more than enough for what we need, is int. Float and double are our decimals, right? So these four up here are our integer values or our whole number of values. Float and double are our decimal point uh, data types. So if I wanted a data type to hold a GPA, for example, I wouldn't want to use an integer for that, right? Because your GPA often has a, a decimal value. So I would say I want a double GPA, which lets me have decimals, or I would say float GPA, which has decimals. So a float has this range here, and a double has this range here. The only really difference between all of these is their ranges and how big they are in memory, right? So a double takes up eight bytes of memory to store a double, whereas a float only takes four bytes of memory to store the float. So floating point numbers, like I said, allow for fractional values. 1.7, negative 47.316, those are examples of floating point numbers. There are two types of data types in Java that represent floating point numbers. We have float and we have double. What kind of stinks about Java is anytime I wrote a floating point literal, Java is going to assume that it is of the double type. Auto, it's just going to assume that. So if I just say you know, this is not going to work even though it looks like it should, right? Because we said, well, floating point numbers have decimal values. Java assumes that this 3.5 is a double value, not a float value. If I want to do a float literal, I have to put the letter F after, F for float. Or you could just make all of your floating point variables doubles and you wouldn't have to worry about it. We can do scientific notation um, in Java. It uses E notation. So this number here, four point whatever times 10 to the fourth would be four point whatever E4 in Java. So I could say that right there for my scientific notation. If I ever needed scientific notation, if you remember from your, your math classes, the E notation works the same in Java. We talked about Boolean logic. We talked about Booleans either being able to be true or false. We have a data type in Java that we can have a variable of called Boolean. And just like the Boolean logic, 
a Boolean data type can either be true or it can be false. And it's the word true or false, right? So I have Boolean, I'll just call it flag. Flag can be true and flag can be false, right? That's all it can be. If I try to make it something else, it's just not gonna work because Booleans can only be true or false, right? char data types store a single character at a time. So that's different than a string, which is like a word, right? Um, char is just a character, a single character. And you'll notice that char literals are in single quotes, whereas string literals are in double quotes. So variable assignment let's say that I want to have a variable called x let's say that I assign x a value of 5 and then I display x to the screen okay There x is. Let's say I change x to x was assigned a value of 5. Let's assign it a new value of 98. And then print x. Now we'll see that it is displaying 598, right? So our hang on just a second. Oh, I tricked myself. This should be print line. So what was happening is it was printing 5 and 98 on the same line and I was very confused. Okay. So what happens is it displays 5. I then change the value of x to be assigned 98. Then it will display 98, right? So whatever was in x got replaced here on line 13, right? And that's because we're using primitive data types. We said a primitive can only hold a single value at a time, right? So x can only hold one integer the first integer it held was 5. I printed out that 5. Then I said, okay, now I want x to store 98. So that 5 is removed from memory. 98 goes in. I display the 98. That's kind of how primitive data types work. They hold one thing at a time. Let's talk operators and arithmetic. So this is like math stuff. Java does have a lot of operators for manipulating data. We have three main types of operators. We have unary operators, binary operators, and ternary operators. And the difference between those is the number of operands that they require. So a unary operator requires only one operand. All right, unary for one. Binary operators require two operands. Ternary operators require three operands. Okay, so here's, here's some examples of some uh, operators here. And I will say that we have an example of a unary operator is the negation operator, which is the, the minus sign. When you're not using it to, to subtract, if you put it in front of something, it's called the negation operator. So let's say that I have, let me get rid of all this. Let's say that I have x is assigned 15 right here. If I do minus x right here, Let's say x is assigned a value of minus x. 
That is called the negation operator. That is an example of a unary operator, right? It only requires one operand, that being this x right here. And it's just gonna flip the, the value of it. So x was positive 15, negation 15 says x is now negative 15. So if I were to display this, it should say negative 15. That's an example of a unary operator. Binary operators are kind of what we're used to. 5 plus 2, value is assigned 10, right? There's an operator in the middle, and there's one thing on each side. So here's some examples of our arithmetic operators that we use in programming. These are very common. Uh, we do a lot of sort of, we don't do a whole lot of heavy math in 1250, but we do do a lot of uh, arithmetic. So plus, minus, multiplication, division, and modulus. Um, all of these first ones here you're probably familiar with. Uh, let's say I have total is assigned cost plus tax, right? So I'm adding cost and tax together. Whatever that value is, I'm throwing it inside the total variable. Here with my subtraction, I'm subtracting tax from the total. Whatever that difference is, I'm throwing it inside my cost variable. So on and so forth. Modulus is probably the only one that you may not be familiar with, and that is the percent sign would be our operator here. Now what modulus does is it performs division and it returns the remainder, um, and it only works with two integers. So if I said 17 mod 3, or modulus 3, we sometimes call it mod, 17 divided by 3, right, would assign would have a remainder of 2, right? So if we were to do, you know, 17 divided by 3 by hand, we would get a remainder of 2. So what happens with modulus is, I say leftover is assigned 17 mod 3. Well, we know 17 mod 3 has a remainder of 2, so leftover would store that remainder inside of it. So we use modulus when we want to get remainders. We can also use modulus to tell us something's even or odd, right? We can divide something by 2. If there is no remainder, then we know it's even. If there is a remainder, then we know it's odd. Now, integer division is a little weird in, in Java, and this is something that like weirds people out a lot. Um, we have something called truncation in Java. So when I say 5 divided by 2, right, normally we're thinking, yeah, 2.5. But because number is an integer, right, and integers are whole number variables, an integer variable cannot hold a decimal value at all. Um, and we've told the computer that it's only going to hold an integer, right? So what will happen here is... If there's a remainder, it's just discarded entirely. So 5 divided by 2 in Java, if it's an integer, is just 2, right? Because that 0.5 is thrown away because it's an int, not a double, right? If this was double number or float number, yeah, 2.5, no problem. But because it's an int, it can't have a decimal value. That 0.5 is just deleted. We do have an order of operations with Java. We have parentheses, we have negations, multiplication, division, mod, plus, minus, or addition, subtraction. We do have a class in the Java API, if you remember the system class where we used print and print line from. Um, called the math class. And the math class has some different methods we can use to perform some normally kind of complex mathematical operations. Um, in this instance, we're focusing on math.pow and math.square root. Um, so what math.pow or power does is it lets you raise a number to a given power. So 
It takes two arguments. Remember, a method argument is just anything that goes inside the parentheses. So math.pal takes two arguments. The first argument is whatever number we want to raise. And the second argument is what we're raising it to. And it's important to note that they're both doubles. So I have 4.0 and 2.0. So what that will do is it will say result is going to be assigned 4 to the second power. Right? So we can use this method here to do that. The square root method only takes one argument and it gives you the square root of the value, right? So we're saying result is assigned the square root of nine, which is three, right? So if I wanted to do this, you know, here, let's say that for our program, we want 15 to the seventh power, right? I don't know what that is. So I could say something like double result, result is assigned math.power 15.0, 7.0, right? So I'm saying 15 to the seventh power, and I guess I can display that just to see what it would be. and we see it's this value here. Square root works the same way. If I wanted to get the square root of like a huge number, let's say I want the square root of that number right there, right? I don't know what the square root of that is. Um, but let's just say I wanted to see what it would be. We could run that and we could see, okay, here's the square root of that crazy big number, right? So just like with the print method where I say system.out.print, I say math, because that's the class I'm accessing, dot square root, or math.pow. Now we do have something called combined assignment operators. And what they do is they combine the assignment operator with the arithmetic operator. So right here, right? We said the equal sign in Java is not equal to, it is assigned to, is what that means. So what I'm saying here is x plus one is assigned to the variable x. So whatever x is, one's going to be added to it and then whatever that value is, is going to be stored into x, right? And here's just some examples of assignment combinations. We do have compound operators, and these are something that people like quite a bit um, once they get used to using them. Basically, Using these combined um, operator statements right here is very common in Java. So what if rather than saying x is assigned x plus 4, I could shorten that and just say, or rather than saying x is assigned x plus 5, I can use a compound operator and just say x plus equals 5, right? And what this is doing is it's saying x plus 5 is assigned to x. It's just a shortcut. Now, if that's confusing, you can do the longer way. It works just as fine. Um, but some people like the compound operators better. All right, so that will do it for this video. Uh, I will record one more about the fundamentals of Java, and then I will address what we'll be doing uh, next week in that video.